Anyway, today um, I'd like to talk to you about disability and the Industrial Revolution in Britain. My name is Daniel Blackie and I will be um, in a way representing a larger project which I'm a member of, which is the Disability and Industrial Society project which is coordinated by Swansea University. So this is a little bit of a taster of what we're trying to do in our project, which we're about halfway through at the moment. So this is like a, some kind of preliminary findings that we've, we've generated. Okay, well, before I go on to talk about disability, I think it's important to say a little bit about the Industrial Revolution. I mean, it's a central concept in my talk today. What exactly is the Industrial Revolution? Well, I haven't got time to go through everything. Lots of historians have made their careers out of debating the characteristics of the Industrial Revolution and the, the, the main features, and there's been debates about when there's been economic takeoffs, when there's been specific structural changes. But what I wanted to do with this particular slide was just to point out some of the features, some of the characteristics of, in, of the Industrial Revolution, which I think spring to mind for most historians and probably for most members of the general public. Industrial Revolution conjures up a certain image. And I think key features are urbanisation, um, the idea of the rise of factories. This is very important in our um, notions of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the rise of mechanisation, so the use of machinery replacing manual labour and uh, such like. Another important feature of the Industrial Revolution is the, uh, uh, the rise of wage labour. Um, production for market, especially exports, so the rise of the market economy. Um, and also a very important aspect of the Industrial Revolution was the expansion and development of a transport infrastructure. So, for instance, canals and railways. So there's a lot of uh, expansion in, in various areas. Um, but OK, so that's just an idea of what I have in mind when I talk about the Industrial Revolution. And hopefully it's hitting many of the ideas that you have about it. OK, so what's this got to do with disability? Well, for disability historians, it's a very interesting period. It's generally asserted that the Industrial Revolution is considered to be a key period in the history of disability. Now, in terms that there's lots of arguments that could be made about the significance of um, industrial economic transformation for disabled people, but the one I want to focus on, which is particularly uh, popular in disability studies and, and disability history is the idea that somehow the Industrial Revolution, Industrial Economic Transformation, gave rise to um, marginalisation and discrimination that disabled people face today. There's also an argument that it's during this period that disabled people become separated off, that they become distinct from the rest of the population, so they become or disability becomes a social category of difference. It's something that marks people off and is sort of separates them from the rest of the non-disabled population. Now, um, there's a problem with this assertion, and it's really one of evidence. At the moment, lots of historians and disability scholars, and indeed disability activists, assert this position that somehow industrial economic transformation has led to the marginalisation of disabled people, but we don't really have much evidence to say whether this is a fair assessment or whether it needs to be modified. Um, so what we're trying to do in this project, uh, the Disability and Industrial Society project, is to basically come up with some findings that allow us to test this idea that the Industrial Revolution was a key moment in the history of disability. Now, our central research question, which is the one I've put here on the slide, you can see, is how were experiences and understanding of disability in Britain affected by industrial development between 1780 and 1948? Now, the way we're doing it is we have chosen to look at the coal industry and coal mining communities, obviously being based here in South Wales, which is a, a very important coal field um, historically in, in Britain. It, it made a lot of sense for scholars being based here in Swansea. Um, but we're looking at coal fields in other parts of the United Kingdom as well. And as you can see from the map I've put here, um, they're scattered all around Britain at this stage in the 19th century. But the three that we are particularly interested in are the South Wales coal field, which again is, you know, we're here now in Swansea in that coal field. 
but we're also interested in the Scottish coalfield, which as you can see on the map here is the, the central part of Scotland. And then the other, the third um, major coalfield we want to look at is the northeastern coalfield that uh, covers Northumberland and Durham. Now, we've chosen to look at the coal industry not simply because we're based here in the South Wales coalfield, but because we think that the uh, coal industry is a particularly good one for testing notions about uh, the relevance of the Industrial Revolution to the history of disability. Now, one, there's, there's lots of reasons why we've chosen to use this, but one of the, perhaps one of the most important reasons is that the coal industry was a particularly um, noteworthy industry or a se industrial sector where occupational um, injury and disease was particularly high. So we can be pretty sure that in the coal industry there is a lot of incidence of disability. So that was one reason why we were drawn to it. The other reason is that in many respects the coal industry, although not, uh, although not displaying all the characteristics that I mentioned in the first slide, do, do have many of these characteristics. So for instance we have things like uh, you know, development of transport infrastructure, we've got uh, the rise of urban uh, areas and urban villages as people are drawn into the coal field. So there's a lot of um, areas in, in terms of uh, representing the Industrial Revolution that the coal industry is good at. Okay, well what I want to particularly uh, concentrate on in this short presentation is uh, disability and work. And I want to focus on work for several reasons. One of them is, is that as this uh, event was held in conjunction with the IPC Athletics Championships, I think disability and work is a good theme to look at because it's, it highlights notions of capability and capacity and, and ability in terms of what disabled people can and, and cannot do or what they're perceived to be able to do. Now, I think uh, very often when we think about disability in Western societies today, our ideas and understandings about disability are very much tied to notions about fitness for work, what bodies are considered productive, what bodies are considered unfit for production. Um, and in discussing um, work, I want to look at What's been, what's been classed as the classic and advanced phase of industrial revolution. So what I'm particularly interested in this talk is the period between 1780 and 1880. And I want to look at work not simply because it's an important uh, aspect of modern definitions of disability. I want to look at work also because um, ideas about the exclusion of disabled people from the workplace are a very important part of this Industrial, revolu industrial revolution thesis, the idea that disabled people have become marginalised due to economic uh, transformations. Okay, so what we've been finding in our project is that once you start looking at the historical evidence and the documentation produced during this period, during the 19th century, disabled people are found working in um, collieries, on quite a significant level. They, they appear a lot in the records. Um, and you're, we'll, we're finding that disabled people are not only working above ground, it's surface work, but they're also very often working underground, very often in some of the most difficult and physically arduous of uh, roles that can be found in, uh, in mine work. Now, one of the, the characters that has particularly taken me is this fella here, Ned, Neddy Rhymer, his, his real name or his full name is Edward Rhymer, but apparently his friends knew him as Neddy. And he was a, an English mine worker who worked in northeast England. Um, and he's an interesting character because as a three year old, he was injured in a house fire in his home and um, lost or his, became visually impaired in one eye and was badly injured on the right side of his body. Now, in the course of his years as a mine worker, he also developed rheumatism, and in the course of his memoirs, which were published late in the 19th century, he often refers to himself as a cripple. So he's identifying as someone who has a physical impairment and is someone who has um, 
some kind of notion that their, their impairment perhaps sets them apart from other members of the workforce. Now, the interesting thing with Reimer is that he starts working as a young boy, as a nine-year-old in the 1840s, as a trapper, which is um, a young boy who is responsible for opening and closing the ventilation doors in a mine, which is um, quite an important job, but it's quite, quite boring. I mean, they basically got to sit on their own all through the shift, opening and closing doors to let uh, coal trams uh, pass um, without affecting the ventilation of the mine, or at least not affecting it in a, in a dangerous way. And I have a, a picture here of um, a contemporary depiction of a a small boy opening the door for a, um, a mine worker who's pushing a, a tram full of coal through the, um, through the mine here. Um, but Reimer didn't stop there. He didn't remain a uh, trapdoor operator for all his career as a mine worker. He went through the occupational spectrum. So he then moved up and started working as a haulier. He was responsible for moving uh, carts and wagons around underground. And eventually, um, for certain times in his career, he also became a coal hewer. So he was responsible for cutting coal as well as just transporting it and, and opening and closing doors. And th this is, I think, particularly noteworthy because this is a man who had multiple impairments and he was engaged in what was arguably or certainly thought of by the workforce as one of the hardest jobs uh, for underground, as, for, uh, that, that an underground worker could do. Um, so, I think Reimer is, a, is interesting because, in a way, he sort of flags up lots of the um, issues and findings that we're generating in this project, no notably that disabled people, despite perhaps some of our expectations, are often working in some of the most physically arduous of jobs. Reimer is also particularly interesting because, unlike many of the other workers we've looked at who are um, disabled as a result of their employment in mining, Reimer was um, picked up his impairments uh, as a very young infant and still went into mining. So I think this is quite an interesting point that physical impairment wasn't an absolute barrier even to entry into mine work in the first instance. Now there's lots of other examples I could uh, point out, but they don't really have time for it. But needless to say, there are lots of uh, documented instances of other disabled mine workers working both above ground and below ground. We've got uh, examples of wooden-legged miners. Um, you know, we've come across many deaf people that have worked in the mines, lots of visually impaired people like, um, like Edward Reimer. So once you start actually researching the disability of history, uh, the history of disability in, um, in the coal industry, it, it, it becomes quite apparent that disabled people are uh, a common sight in coal mining communities and at collieries and uh, in mines and uh, on the surface more generally. Okay, well, I don't want to portray this image that you know all disabled people were working as hewers doing the most physically you know demanding of jobs. Clearly, there were some instances where you know physical impairment would have impinged upon a person's ability to do some of the most demanding, um, strenuous jobs. And um, as, a, as a result, what we find is that there are some uh, disabled mine workers that are, after picking up an injury in the workplace, are assigned to lighter jobs or to lighter tasks. And there's a range of jobs that we found that uh, disabled mine workers have been given after particularly serious injuries. And here are a few that I've put here on the slide. Um, and the kind of jobs that uh, disabled mine workers were given were, I guess in a way, there's an easy, easy distinction to make. There were those that were given jobs that were underground jobs, and then those that were given jobs that were surface or above ground jobs. Now the first two here, the furnace keepers and trappers would have been underground jobs. I've mentioned the trappers. These were the generally young boys that would um, open and close ventilation doors. But there are instances of um, disabled men being assigned this work too. Furnace keepers were particularly important because they were responsible for keeping and maintaining the furnaces that were very important for ventilation at this time. So it's quite a big responsibility. 
But again, there is uh, evidence to suggest that sometimes disabled, um, injured miners were given this task. It was considered lighter work than hewing or, or haulage work. On the surface, there were a range of jobs, and I think it's very important to acknowledge this, that you know, when we talk about mining and mine work, we're not just talking about below ground work. There were a range of ancillary and support uh, tasks that needed to be conducted and carried out on the surface. And here's a few examples of uh, some of the tasks that disabled miners were known to have been assigned after they had um, been injured in the workplace. So we have positions like lamp men, knockers and callers and teachers. Now the lamp men were, I've, I've put a photo up here on the slide, these were men that were responsible for maintaining and looking after miners' lamps um, and these were you know, generally done on, on the surface, but it was a, a task that didn't require too much uh, physical exertion, so it's something that either elderly miners or injured miners were sometimes given. Uh, knockers and callers are apparently um, mine workers or men in a colliery community that were assigned the job of going around uh, individual do uh, houses and knocking on the doors at an at a assigned time to rouse the menfolk of that particular cottage uh, to get up in time for their shift. So they were basically like human alarm clocks. They would go around knocking on the door saying, Oi, Joe, up you get, it's time for your shift. Um, okay, now the, I think the, the important thing to say when we talk about work in mining, you know, I don't want people to leave here with the idea that somehow this is a disabled utopia. This wasn't, you know, this is mine work in the 19th century. This was a really tough, brutal, you know, horrible industry to be working in at this time. There's not many people today that would want to work in those conditions, you know, regardless of physical ability or capacity. So I think it's very, very important not to romanticise the past. In pointing out that disabled people worked in the past, that doesn't mean everything was fantastic and people are skipping to work and you know, having a nice time and getting high fives off their work colleagues. This clearly wasn't the case. When we start researching disability history in the coal mining industry, it becomes obvious very quickly that as a disabled worker in these workplaces, Life was tough, it wasn't, it wasn't a stroll in the park. Now, Reimer, if you read his memoir that was published at the end of the 19th century, gives lots and lots of instances of um, moments in his career where he, you know, he, he experienced difficulties and challenges that were related to his physical impairments. Here's one quote I extracted from his um, recollections of his time as a boy, as a trapper, in the 1840s in North East England. And he says, I had to adapt myself to the circumstances with which I was surrounded, Detective sight, defective sight causing me endless troubles and often bringing me into collision with those who felt disposed to act the part of tyrant or persecutor, imposing work upon me which as a doorkeeper I had no right to perform. Now this is a theme that comes up a lot in Reimer's memoir, and I think we have to read it, we have to be a bit careful about um, taking his word on everything. Um, Reimer was a, uh, a strident unionist and he had a bit of a reputation as being a, a difficult character, at least with management. So you know, we have to read these pronouncements with some care. But what, a theme that comes across in his memoir quite strongly is the notion that you know, his physical impairment did cause him problems. And there are instances quite a few in fact where he notes uh, persecution or where he feels he's being bullied as a result of having a particular physical impairment. So there's another um, instance that he notes and apparently during a, a pay dispute in 1859 when Reimer was standing up for the rights of uh, haulage workers underground he got into an altercation with his supervisor um, about you know, wanting uh, a better rate of pay for the job that him and his workmates were doing. And according to his memoir, Ryan was very hurt by this incident because um, during the debate or the discussion, or the very heated discussion with his supervisor, the overman who was the, the supervisor, 
made some brutal remarks about my lameness. So this was something that was, you know, thrown in his face, this, the, the idea that he had um, mobility impairments due to rheumatism. It was something that it seems, uh, you know, was pointed out in the workplace. It wasn't ignored, it was remarked upon. And this often caused him a lot of hurt and, uh, and, uh, you know, and difficulties in his, in his working life. There's also lots of examples, not just from Reimer's accounts, but of um, other mine workers and other uh, witnesses that e examined people that were uh, mine workers during this time. There seems to be quite a lot of uh, instances of children that were mine workers being uh, subjected to corporal punishments for beating. There's lots of instances of children being beaten. It seems that, uh, you know, Reimer experienced this too. There are instances of him getting into fights with other kids underground and it seems that disability was no barrier to the, to the, the usual beatings and, and brutality that some mine workers experienced at this time. Okay, well, I think I'll draw it to a, a close now as I can see there's hundreds of people tapping their feet and looking like they're, they're ready to, to move out of this room. Um, I want to make a few general points. The first one is that what we're finding in this project, and these are tentative findings at this stage, we're halfway through the, the larger project. So how this will pan out in the future is difficult to say exactly at this point. However, I think our research is showing at this stage that perhaps industrial economic development, perhaps the industrial revolution is not as disruptive as is often assumed by scholars and by the, the wider population more generally. In saying this, however, I think it's important to say these are early days in terms of uh, this kind of research. A lot more research is uh, required, not just for the coal industry, but for other industries too. It might be, we don't know yet until this work's done, it might be that the coal industry represents some very special case and the arguments that I'm making today do not apply or would not hold for other industrial sectors. That is a work that needs to be done by other, other researchers and other, other projects that hopefully come to fruition in the, you know, after this one. The other thing I think it's very important to say is that you know, often uh, disability and ideas about disability uh, are connected to notions about capacity for work and I think very often the, the common idea is that disabled people um, have difficulties or are, are unfit for work and I think when you look at the history of coal mining in the 19th century and find that disabled people are working in quite significant numbers in some of the most demanding and physically ar arduous of tasks you know it makes us stop and think about some of these stereotypes we have about disabled people's capacities. However, in saying that, I want to reiterate, and this is an important point, by pointing out that disabled people participated in the labour force, I do not want, and I don't think my colleagues want to imply that this was a fantastic disabled person's paradise where everyone was integrated and, and uh, accepted by their work colleagues. There were clearly issues involving disability and there were, there were clearly difficulties that disabled people encountered in participating in the, in the ordinary working life of a, of a coal mine and a colliery community. Now, finally, I want to just make a, a final point about what I think disability history more generally, um, not just our project, but disability history more generally, has to tell us. And I think the main thing that for me as a, as a disability historian, that disability history teaches us or cautions us, is that disability is not static, it's not a constant phenomenon. The responses to it, attitudes to disability and disabled people are constantly changing. They're not universal, they're not rooted. Um, it, they are, they are ever-changing. And Now this is important because what it means is that the, the position of disabled people today can be changed. Now I think very often people get excited about this. Oh well if you know, disability can change, that's great. We can sort of push things forward and there'll be a a, a, a progressive move forward and things will get much better. But I think if you're looking at uh, labour force participation, you could make a tentative case that in the past disabled people were a bit more integrated into the economy than perhaps they are today. 
And if that's the case, you could make an argument that the change that has occurred in the last 150 years hasn't necessarily always been positive, hasn't always necessarily always been good. So I think the powerful thing about disability history is it says change is possible, but we mustn't assume that change is always beneficial, is always positive. We must also, and this is very important, defend the hard-won gains that have been made and make sure things don't actually get worse because change can go either way. 